Hello, listeners. Thanks for stopping in to the podcast. We wanted to let you know about our Charlotte conference coming up in a couple of weeks. Very excited about this. Information's on the website. There's still seats available. Please consider coming to join us for our second CME event this year. The Ortho PAC, hosted by Sam Dyer. Welcome to the Ortho PAC, where we discuss up-to-date orthopedic topics for the busy clinician. I invite you to sit back and relax as I attempt to fill in the gaps between education, current events, and real-world practice. Hello, listeners. This is Sam Dyer. You have me again today. We're going to talk about musculoskeletal injections, or MSK injections. I'd just like to go through some basics and some landmarks for different anatomical areas. So, when should you use cortisone injections? Indications typically are things such as bursitis, tendonitis, trigger points, neuromas, entrapment syndrome, osteoarthritis, gouty arthropathy or crystalloid arthropathy, pseudogout, synovitis, inflammatory arthritis. Contraindications, which we all have to consider, but we don't always think about, would be things like cellulitis or septic arthritis, an acute fracture, bacteremia, uh, presence of a joint prosthetic, really need to avoid Achilles and patella tendinopathies, and of course, if someone has an allergy to any of the medications. Relative or minor contraindications, I guess you could call it minor contraindications, would be minimal relief after injections, someone that has a coagulopathy or is on anticoagulation therapy, and if there is significant osteoporotic changes around the joint, if the joint is inaccessible, or if the patient has poorly controlled diabetes. Those are all considerations to keep in mind. The cocktails that I use, and uh, there's a variety of different cortisone brands you can use, but typically I use triamcinolone mixed with either bupivacaine or lidocaine. Bupivacaine 0.25%, lidocaine 1%. A lot of people would use celestone or depamedrol. Celestone is nice because it is water-soluble, whereas triamcinolone is fat-soluble. So if you're doing an extra-articular injection, uh, the fat cells can soak up the triamcinolone, and that can result in fat tissue atrophy and skin depigmentation. So you have to be cautious with that. Intra-articular injections, typically not a big deal. In my personal anecdotal, emphasis on anecdotal experience, triamcinolone is more effective than celestone, but case-by-case -case basis apply. You'll need to gather some equipment for a cortisone injection. I recommend you use the smallest syringe possible that will accommodate the volume of the solution that you want to inject, i.e. if you're doing a 5cc injection, use a 5cc syringe. If you're doing a trigger finger or carpal tunnel and you're using a volume of one to one and a half cc's or two cc's, use a 3cc syringe. I usually use a 25 gauge needle, inch and a half for most deep injections in a 25 gauge, either inch and a half or 5 eighths inch for extra articular injections. I prefer betadine over alcohol, although that is a little controversial. I, I think betadine is safer, but that's certainly my preference. You can use alcohol if you'd like. I like to have several gauze pads. I use ethyl chloride spray to provide a topical anesthetic. And then of course a Band-Aid for or after. If we talk about Celestone versus Kenalog and, and commonly used injection cocktails, for a knee joint, I'll typically use 40 milligrams of triamcinolone or Kenalog interchangeable and one cc or six milligrams of Celestone, and then whatever local anesthetic you like. I like Marcaine with intra-articular injections because it's longer lasting. Extra-articular injections, I'll typically use lidocaine as part of the cocktail. Some people mix the two. There were some reports that Marcaine might cause more soft tissue irritation, so keep that in mind. Knee joints, my volume of injection is usually 5 cc's, 1 cc of triamcinolone, 4 cc's of Marcaine, subacromial bursa, 40 milligrams of triamcinolone, and 4 mLs of Marcaine. Trogenteric bursitis, the same as the knee and shoulder. For lateral epicondylitis, again, with the concern about fat cell atrophy, I'll use one cc of celestone and one ml of lidocaine. Same for carpal tunnel. Trigger finger, I decrease the volume to one cc with uh, half a cc of celestone and half cc of lidocaine. For equair veins, I will also use one ml of celestone and one ml of lidocaine. So the rule of thumb is uh, you need more volume for large joint spaces and less volume for extra-articular structures. 
Okay, let's talk about injections. There are several types of places you can put the cortisone, and we'll start at the top and move our way down. So if we're looking at uh, subacromial injections for subacromial bursitis. The indications are subacromial impingement, AC joint arthropathy, or chronic tear arthropathy, or ongoing shoulder pain. You can do a subacromial injection for glenohumeral joint osteoarthritis, but frequently you need to redirect at least half the syringe into the glenohumeral joint. Not really going to talk about that as much today, but subacromial injections are something that I see pretty much every day that somebody needs. Uh, So it's important to know the landmarks and how to do it. I'll have the patient sitting on the edge of the exam table with their back toward me. I like to have them sit on the end of the table for a right shoulder or on the edge of the table facing the wall for a left shoulder. And the way to find the landmarks is you palpate the spine of the scapula laterally till you get to the posterior lateral corner of the acromion. And the target is about a centimeter inferior to the posterior lateral corner. Sometimes you can feel a little sulcus there. You want the needle parallel to the floor, but then you want to also add about 5 to 10 degrees of cephalic angle and aim just medial to the anterolateral corner of the acromion. Your target is right along that lateral edge. If you read the text, they talk about aiming at the coracoid, which is somewhat of a difficult proposition uh, because more likely than not, if you put your needle all the way in or hub the needle, you'll be in cuff tissue and you don't want to inject it that way. You want to inject it into the bursa above it. Depending on the size of the patient, I'll in, put the needle in halfway to a full length and bolus the entire content over three to five seconds. And a common theme with these injections, if you notice resistance, it means you're in something and you should redirect. A hint for injections to help you with this is if you have your assistant distract the shoulder, pulling down on the shoulder that will significantly increase the subacromial space, it makes it a lot easier to get the injection in. So while you're practicing these, that's a, a good technique. Okay, moving down, uh, lateral epicondylitis, medial epicondylitis. Those are super easy. You find the lateral epicondyle and palpate for the tender spot and just inject right at that spot. Uh, You put your needle in, the needle goes down to lateral epicondyle, pull back a millimeter or two and just do a slow bolus over three to five seconds and that's it. Same thing with the medial epicondyle. Now, one thing about the medial epicondyle, the ulnar nerve lies just posterior to that. So be careful and you don't want to inject around the ulnar nerve and the patient has a uh, wrist drop for a few hours. I've had that happen one time early on. So just go with my mistake and try to not get around the ulna. Uh, But the same technique, inject down to the medial epicondyle, retract back a little and do your bolus. For the lateral epicondyle injection, I'll have the patient sitting, kind of hugging a pillow. And for the medial epicondyle, I'll have them lying down, abduct their shoulder about 90 degrees with their elbow flexed. That's a good way to get to that anatomy. And moving on down the arm, dequervenes tenus synovitis, uh, very common that people get an overuse tendonitis, the EHL and APB of the thumb. And what I'll do is, uh, hopefully everyone knows what a Finkelstein's exam is. I'll do that uh, to ensure that it's a positive test, but then do a resisted thumb extension and you can palpate the tendons that way. If you've ever started a IV in the quote unquote intern vein along the side of the wrist, you want to inject that uh, tendon sheath similarly to how you're doing that IV, about five to 10 degrees from parallel from the skin. You infiltrate the tendon sheath, and it only takes just a little poke there. And typically, it'll be a wheel that kind of progresses out. My mentor told me it's like a sausage, but I never really got that. But you want the wheel, and it kind of elongates out. And you inject your volume over three seconds, take it out, and that does well. Okay, that's all I've got for now. I hope this was helpful to you. For most orthopedic people, this is a basic review but hopefully some of our new colleagues and others will get some useful information from this. If you have any questions about it, let us know. One thing I did want to announce that we are definitely going to do an orthopedic boot camp again this year. This will be our second one. Our conference planner, I authorized him to start planning it. Uh, dates are to be determined, but we will have a musculoskeletal injection workshop that will be part of that boot camp. So mark your calendars. Most likely it'll be November time frame, but we'll see. Uh, details will be on the PAOS.org website. And thanks a lot. 
Thank you for joining the Ortho PAC podcast. Hello, listeners. I hope you enjoyed the uh, last two podcasts on eSports. Very fascinating information for me. Coming up soon, I'm going to have a discussion with a physician on virtual reality and orthopedics, which is just a fascinating topic for me. I can't wait to go over that. So please stay tuned. That'll be coming up soon.